CGTN, China Global Television Network. Early in the 17th century, Galileo Galilei became the first of the great scientists to use the telescope, a quite novel instrument at the time, to study the moon. The greatest of all telescopes. From the ancient stargazers to modern explorers, our fascination with space echoes our desire to unravel the secrets of the universe. As humanity continues to look further, pushing the boundaries of knowledge and technological advancement, what impact is it having closer to home? The South African Radio Astronomy Observatory is one of the preeminent radio telescope facilities on the continent. Bonso Maruping heads up the organization and is aiming to make South Africa a world leader in mapping the cosmos. I kind of stumbled into space uh, when I worked for the department of, it used to be science and technology at the time. Uh, and uh, we were looking at um, rebuilding the science system, and I worked on actually establishing the South African Space Agency because South Africa used to have a space program before that was stopped when we went into the new democracy. That started then and evolved into working more on the looking down. <laughs> and now I would say I'm, I'm more involved in the looking up. And there's quite a crossover in terms of the type of things you do, whether you're using satellites to observe Earth or uh, using telescopes to observe the universe. In 2012, South Africa was selected, along with Australia, to host a groundbreaking new project in the field of astronomy. The Square Kilometre Array project is an ambitious international collaboration aimed at building the world's largest radio telescopes. Designed to explore the universe with unprecedented detail and sensitivity. Once completed, the SKA telescope will span over a square kilometer of collecting area, combining dishes and antennas from across the globe capable of observing a wide range of astronomical phenomena. from the early formation of galaxies to the search for extraterrestrial life. The SK project started more than 20 years ago now with a bunch of astronomers uh, looking at the next big thing and coming up with the idea that, uh, you know, the thing that's needed the most is a radio telescope because optical instruments can only do so much and uh, um, led to um, South Africa uh, submitting a bid uh, to host. In 2005, South Africa submitted a bid to host the project along with a number of other nations. When South Africa applied to host the SKA, we didn't know what the decision was going to be, um, and so we still wanted to have a, a premier radio telescope. So that's what Meerkat is. It's South Africa's precursor instrument to the Square Kilometre Array, and it has 64 dishes. The SKA came into being because we're always wanting to see things better, so better resolution, finer detail. While optical telescopes observe visible light, Radio telescopes detect and analyze radio waves, allowing astronomers such as Dr. Knowles to study different aspects of the universe. And with radio, you're dealing with the really long 
lazy wavelengths and you need a very big collecting area to get the same resolution as, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, you can't build a massive dish, just, you know, there's engineering and, and technical reasons and monetary reasons. So if you join a bunch of small ones together, you form an interferometer and that simulates one really big collecting area. That basically views the sky and then there's this complex mathematical relationship between where the telescope collects the data and the, the image space that we're more used to, so the pretty pictures. So the telescope takes the data and then it's up to the, the scientists to convert that into an image. One of South Africa's key attributes was its ability to provide a suitable location for the dishes to be built on. Radio telescopes require radio quietness, which is really difficult to do now because everything we use uh, emits uh, radio waves and causes interference. So one of the requirements was to find a place quiet enough that you could build an instrument like this and not disturb the people that already live in that area. The Northern Cape is the largest yet most sparsely populated province in South Africa. Just over 2% of the population live here. There's a lot of radio telescopes in the Northern Hemisphere, but in the South there are not many, and here we have a great complementarity because we are uh, looking at a different sky than the North, and the combination of the two will uh, be very powerful to reveal some of the very interesting phenomena in the universe. And the second is about radio frequency interference, because radio telescope working the frequency of a few hundred megahertz is very easily to be contaminated by the human-made signal. As you can see, the Green Band Telescope in West Virginia, that there's a lot of this very strong emission from our human uh, interference. This frequency range, which has been occupied by our human interventions, will not be able to used to analyze astronomy data. And we can only use the gap in between, like this yellow range and so on. So it's quite limited. Whereas if you look at the Karoo Desert, which is in, uh, in Kanawha in Northern Cape, we have very few interventions. So these are just the, the International Space Station uh, that flying across the sky, which have some interference, but we're pretty clean. And that's the second reason that we choose Kanawha and the Karoo Desert as the SK site. After being selected to be one of the two nations along with Australia to host the SKA telescopes, South Africa embarked on the monumental task of laying the foundations for their construction in such a remote location. Roads, buildings, power lines, and an optic fiber network all had to be installed in the barren landscape. Construction of the first 64 dishes funded by the South African government and known as Meerkat began the following year. Later on, the SKA will add another 133 dishes to these 64 dishes, and each of them will have a diameter of 15 meters. So there's a slight difference between the diameter of the two dishes. We want to have a pretty Complementary, we call UV coverage, which is actually the Fourier mode of the sky. Once the project is completed, South Africa will host 197 dishes ranging over 85,000 square kilometers. So the layout of this is actually by consideration that we want to cover as much ultraviolet uh, UV coverage, or let's say Fourier mode of sky as possible. While construction of the telescope dishes takes place in South Africa's remote Northern Cape, 
the project is managed 700 kilometers away in Cape Town. Now that the first 64 dishes are operational, a host of international astronomers are lining up to make use of the telescope, so keeping it online is a critical job. Here, Bonzo heads up a team who work day and night. This is the control room. What you see here on display is the dashboards of what we look at when we observe. We have a set of uh, operators here that op operate 24 uh, seven. We have here on my screen here, the cameras that are actually looking on site live. So what you see here is the telescopes uh, that we operate. It also it assists us in seeing uh, what activities are taking place on site. Uh, there could be maybe some maintenance guys uh, walking around there, or there could be an animal uh, passing by. So we are able to see things as they happen. These are the alarms of um, critical issues that could be taking place on site. What is most, most important for us as telescope operators is to look at the wind speed and the wind gust. It's because the telescopes are, are, are huge, right? And um, when the wind blows, it can actually uh, destroy the uh, mechanicals of the telescope. So that's why it's very important for us to know exactly how the weather is looking. The system is built such that it can automatically stow itself. So essentially what they do, they position themselves in a way that will protect the telescope from being damaged by the wind. Since it created its first image in 2016, the Meerkat telescope has been giving astronomers a glimpse of the project's potential. This is probably one of the most famous images that Meerkat's taken to date. So this is um, looking at the, the heart of our own galaxy. It had been looked at before, but what Meerkat was really showing us is this region in a lot better detail. And so you're seeing a lot of supernova remnants. That's a lot of these sort of bubbles that you're seeing. And um, these filamentary structures are things that we're still trying to explain. This bright spot here is, is the heart of our galaxy. That's where our black hole lives. And again, you're seeing a lot of this sort of filamentary kind of structure. We need to do a bit more work in terms of explaining them with the physics. And then this is great. This is um, what we call the, the snake and the mouse. Um, so you've got one of the brighter filaments here, which is called the snake. Um, and this is a, a supernova remnant that you get from the, the death of a star. Um, and what we think this is, is a pulsar that has escaped possibly when the star exploded. We hadn't seen this in that level of detail before. And this was um, a really cool discovery, one of the was unknown unknowns, where this is a, um, a radio galaxy, you've got a, um, a black hole in the center that's ejecting emission out close to the speed of light. And we'd seen that many, many times before. But what Meerkat showed us for the first time were these filaments joining these lobes. And we really just don't have a physical explanation for these yet. And so it's these types of discoveries, you know, we're starting to see, but I think are gonna become almost quite common in the era of the SKA. This is mostly what I work on, galaxy clusters that, that shine in the radio where the emission is from the cluster itself rather than the individual galaxies. And so what we've got here is two what we call uh, relics. So these typically trace shock regions where galaxy clusters have bashed into each other. So really trying to understand the physics of how this is generated. This is one of the, the messier galaxies. And then if we just, if our eyes were sensitive enough to see this level of detail, we would just see the galaxy right in the center. But when you look at the same patch of sky with radio, you're picking up this massive amount of extent that you just don't see in other wave bands. In the seven years it has been operational, the telescope has been pushing the boundaries of what is observable in our universe, revealing the cosmos like never before.
The operations team in Cape Town is supported on the ground by a team of engineers based outside of the remote town of Carnarvon. It is their job to address any concerns as quickly as possible to keep the Meerkat telescope online 24-7. Years ago, this was actually a research station for the Department of Agriculture. And over the years, Sereo decided to get the space from starting only at this building, which is a few offices for about 10 to 20 people, and then eventually moving to a site that actually can host up to 100 people. And this telescope maintenance office consists of our labs for the mechanical teams as well as the receiver teams. This department is what we call the receiver technician's lab. This is where the receiver team comes and assembles and tests, and even to a certain extent fix the receivers that's being used on the antenna. So what you firstly see this side is what we call the RFI tent, the radio frequency interference tent. What we have here is testing equipment that simulates the conditions on site or what we expect the receiver to perform with on site. So this is where you do your final testing. And this is almost like a site acceptance test. It's all done from this sensitive equipment that simulates also parts of what is inside of the structure, the antenna dish. So it's, everything is done from the screens. We simulate the conditions that we expect on site, make sure everything does comply with it. And then after accepting them, we then take receivers specifically, and then we package them in these boxes and then we move them to site. While Virgilian is stationed at the control center, at least two technicians are always available on site for manual adjustments. By this, you can see what is currently happening at the actual antenna, which is M00. We may check there for any faults, or if there is some errors, correct them remotely. This is our admin block. And as you can see here, there's an overview of the health of the receptors currently on site. We have 53 and 54 that is on plan maintenance for the week, right? We just wanted to confirm if we maybe can book the antennas from the operators to make sure that we can work on it. With the maintenance team working day and night to keep the Meerkat telescope online, a huge amount of data is generated demanding sophisticated infrastructure and cutting edge technologies to capture and preserve it. Bonso has been responsible for overseeing the development of a supercomputer capable of processing this data in order to reveal the discoveries within. When we first uh, built Meerkat, we quickly realized that it's actually not possible to just buy compute and storage equipment that we needed. It was just totally unaffordable. We were fortunate enough to have some of the smartest people around. They actually built our compute and storage using off-the-shelf equipment and open source software. And that was the reason we were able to get to the levels that we were able to in terms of our archiving and compute capabilities. Going forward, this is going to increase even more. Uh, I think we'll be going from something around two terabytes per second per telescope to like 20 terabytes per second. It's going to push the boundaries for sure in terms of what is required uh, from compute and storage. The first 64 dishes were predominantly built using South African funding and local expertise. However, the next phase of the square kilometer array will take a global approach. Yes, it's based here and we definitely are 
improving the capacity of South Africa to, to use it, um, but our international relationships are really important and a lot of the really great science is being done with these, these international collaborations, of which many South Africans are a part or leading them. South Africa, the UK, Australia and China were some of the founding members of the project. However, SKA has now developed an intergovernmental organization with 16 international partners, of which nine are official member countries. With these countries contributing funding, expertise and manpower to the project, it has been able to create a global network of influence. China was selected uh, to provide the dishes for SKA. So they are involved with uh, that part of the project as a member. The China's involvement in the project uh, are basically uh, form two parts. One part is about contributing to the dish of the SKA. And the other major part is about scientific collaboration. So uh, China has a lot of radio astronomers, cosmologists, and astrophysicists, and uh, they are forming a team uh, to participate in this international group of uh, SKA we call SK Science Working Group. With over 2 billion euros due to be spent over the coming years, some have questioned the necessity of the project in developing countries such as South Africa, where the economy is struggling and one in every three South Africans is unemployed. Astronomy is really important in terms of the sciences, in, particularly in developing countries, because although the core research feels very esoteric, the fascination of astronomy, I think, is very relevant to everyone, no matter where you're from, what economic bracket you're in, your culture, etc. Astronomy is a great way to get people interested in STEM careers, so science, technology, maths, those sort of things. And you come into it because it's interesting and it's fascinating. You're trying to understand these puzzles and it sort of opens a gateway to other science careers and that has a major knock-on effect in economies. One of the things that Sarao did well from the beginning is to uh, ensure that we have a human capital development program that can support the growth of astronomy in South Africa and Africa. So we've awarded more than 1,500 bazaaris since then. Started from, I think then, a handful of astronomers to more than 200 South African astronomers now. I mean, it's just been amazing to see this growth in the program and the number of universities that offer astronomy now. Human capital development is on every level. We're also developing technicians. We actually have an artisan training center. We started with electricians. We'll be expanding this to include uh, other trades because all of these are the the type of trades we need, not only to construct the telescope, but to also maintain it throughout. The uncertainty was huge. So people didn't know what to expect. And at that time, everybody was still a little bit unsure of how things would unfold eventually. And I think as the project has grown over the years, people just start to realize the opportunities that is hidden within this great project that's being built here. For a rural town like Carnarvon, Opportunities are limited. And something like this is actually giving us a great stepping stone into the future, especially economically. For the project to be a success, its benefits need to be felt at all levels of society. But for it to build a legacy, it must look to the future. Through a robotics program at Carnarvon High School, students are gaining access to science in a way that is engaging and fun. 
while stimulating them to discover how it can be used practically in their lives. I think science is important because it helps you discover things you didn't really know. It's like explains all of the things that are going on around you, like everything in the world basically works with science. If I could create a robot, I would have created a robot that could have done some chores for other people that couldn't do it like for the people being disabled. I love the about the robotics is how to design different robots, the different missions and the different types of missions that you see in everyday life. There is a worrying shortage of scientists and engineers in South Africa. So it is vital that students start to see the value in this as a potential career path if the country is to address the development issues it faces in this field. Right now we have almost uh, 40 kids in Carnarvon. Sarau South African Radio and Astronomy provides the program in nine schools because there isn't so much kids that are interested in science, tech, uh, engineering stuff in this area. And also because kids this side are not as knowledgeable, I would say, regarding what's happening around, because it's, it's a small, tiny place. So you don't get so much uh, regarding tech, that the latest tech that's out there or, or whatsoever. So introducing such things and having them going, let's say, to Johannesburg and internationally, it opens up a lot of things for them. Yeah, it's just more physical stuff that they are doing, playing with the stuff and learning. While they are thinking that they are not learning, it's just playtime, but it's more learning than just playing. The last group that left is at university now. Some are doing data science, some are doing physics. Is still moving the way that we hope it, it, it will. As we continue our exploration of the cosmos, the further we look, the greater the potential to not only expand our horizons, but also to create a multitude of opportunities here on Earth by propelling scientific breakthroughs and technological advancement while inspiring a new generation of explorers. In our next sort of 10 to 30 years, and hopefully many, many years after that, we'll be using it, in terms of the, the science that we're going to go after, the most fascinating thing for me, what we like to call the unknown unknowns. So the things that we haven't even dreamed about thinking about yet. Um, I think that's where the really amazing stuff is going to get done. We can assume a lot of discovery from SKA because it's unprecedented sensitivity, the sky coverage, and also the integration time. So we should have a lot of unexpected discovery, something unknown, unknown from SKA. And that is something we are very looking forward. A lot of people, when I tell them I work in this space, they ask me, are we going to find a life in space? And my answer is, if there's any chance it exists, I strongly believe this instrument will be designed to find it. When I am in an area where I can, you know, look up at that, that starry sky, I don't tend to think about the, the hardcore research, I must admit. Um, it's that feeling like you're a, a tiny little spark in a much bigger universe. You're so tiny, but you're part of something just fantastic. Mm -hmm.